Um, well, obviously, if you're in the livestock production business, you're selling into the commodity market. People selling directly are doing okay now, uh, if they're selling any volume uh, direct to consumer. But um, the, uh, hey Noah, can, can you get it to where I can share my screen? Yep, let me change that real quick. Um, obviously, <laughs> Commodity price, commodity price, beef and and other animal products right now are are not very good, largely because of the the pandemic, obviously, and that makes it more imperative than ever that if we cannot control the price we receive for a product, the one thing we can control is how much we spend to produce it. And in a pastured livestock operation, the majority of our cost are involved in providing feed during the winter. Uh, during the, the time when we traditionally do not have pasture, at least not green growing pasture. But one of the, the biggest uh, paradigms that I've had to overcome in my life was that uh, I grew up thinking that the grazing season was the same as the growing season. And now I've, I've discovered that the grazing season, if you manage correctly, can be 365 and one quarter days out of the year. And so um, one of the, some of the things we're gonna look at, and it seems rather, it, we're gonna look at stockpiling, the part one of this presentation, this evening's talk, is gonna be about stockpiled summer annual crops for winter pasture, and that seems somewhat counterintuitive. Um, and when this was first brought up to me, stockpiled summer annuals, uh, why would anyone do that? Um, why don't we look at uh, winter annuals for pasture? And, and we'll do that. And in part two, that's one of the things we'll talk about. But I'll talk about some of the, um, some of the advantages of this approach as we, uh, Oh, here we go. Okay. Stockpiled winter feed. Why, why are we looking at summer annuals? In particular, we're, we're going to focus on sorghum as a stockpiled summer annual for winter feeding. Why would we do that? What's the advantages of this? Well, one obvious advantage is just yield, the biomass. Um, sorghum will just produce more tonnage per acre than just about anything we can grow in the temperate areas. Even over much of the tropics, as far as annual plants, it just out produces everything. And some of these uh, winter stockpile mixes, uh, some of the reports I've heard back, I would say on the low end, people are looking at uh, wintering a cow on one acre for three or four months. Um, there's hardly any pasture resources other than sorghum that can accomplish that. Another thing, and of course uh, here in the Great Plains, water is always a concern. Uh, we, uh, when people have me describe my uh, climate when I travel around uh, the country, I say I live in a desert that floods all the time, and uh, we'll, we'll have about 360 days of drought punctuated by five days of flood. And uh, so moisture deficiency is always a fear. And if you look at the water use efficiency of sorghum compared to cool season grasses, um, sorghum will produce about twice as much plant, uh, plant material as what cool season grasses will. And um, another advantage sorghum has is that because it is very heat tolerant, and you look at this blue curve here, this is, this is uh, from a solar power company, and that blue line shows the amount of solar energy that's available throughout the year. And obviously it peaks around the summer solstice in June. And because sorghum grows during the summer, 
it just has more hours and more photons available to photosynthesize. And, and so a summer productive crop is always going to be more productive than a winter productive crop in our environment. And another thing about sorghum is that it gets very tall. Um, the picture here, this is from uh, um, my farm, and those are my cattle. And that is stockpiled sorghum that is, and the cattle are grazing. We just had an 18 inch snow, and it was minus 20 degrees. And ordinarily when it's minus 20 degrees, I don't like to go outside. But uh, these cattle didn't seem to mind. They were just quite happy to be grazing away at this stockpiled sorghum through a, a pretty deep snow. And uh, sorghum also, because it has a waxy cuticle on the, uh, on the outside of the leaf, it has a, uh, an ability to shed moisture uh, it does not deteriorate and drop in quality like most other, uh, almost all other plants. That, that waxy layer on the surface of the leaf slows the deterioration down and, and keeps some quality um, when other, other plants don't maintain quality. Now, that doesn't mean that sorghum is a, a perfect winter feed. It's not, it's far from perfect. It does have some uh, drawbacks. And one is that it, it tends to be very low in protein, especially in the dormant stage. Now uh, I've got 8.34% on this one, but that's actually much higher than typical. Typically a, a sorghum forage that's dormant will run anywhere from three to 6% protein. And rumen microbes need a minimum of 7% protein in order to function. So we need to get that animal's diet up. And, and we'll talk about some strategies for doing that uh, with some of our mixtures here in a bit. And another problem with sorghum, and, and some of this is due to some of the genetics we use, but um, sorghum, because it gets tall, uh, can be prone to lodge in the winter. It may, it may stand better than some plants, but uh, the taller things get, the more likely they are to fall over. And that's the same with sorghum. And uh, so keeping it standing during the winter, the entire winter can be a challenge. Now, when do you plant sorghum? And so there's two primary windows for planting sorghum. Um, the first window, I guess the window starts when soil temperatures climb above 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And depending on where you are within, within the world, um, around here, that usually occurs sometime in late May, early June. And this is the, the planting window that's going to be most productive the vast majority of the time because you our most productive months, most of the time, are May and June because we're getting, typically getting rainfall. We have favorable temperatures, warm enough, but not too hot. And we have long days of sunlight centered around that summer solstice. So if we can get that sorghum up and growing at the earliest opportunity after it hits 60, degrees soil temperature in the spring, that's gonna give us the most production per acre. Now, the second window, and this is uh, basically a window uh, of opportunity rather than optimum. Um, it's an opportunity because after small grain harvest out here on the plains, when you look at our double crop options, what can you plant after that small grain harvest? We're usually into the heat of July, um, late June, July, early August, and moisture is short, it's hot, and we don't have a lot of time. So a lot of our cropping options are very risky, you know, double crop soybeans or, you know, some sort of double crop option might be pretty risky. Uh, and 
but using sorghum because of its drought tolerance, its productivity, its ability to, if, if you get soybeans grown up to the reproductive stage, the water shuts off and they die, you've got nothing. If you get sorghum up to, uh, forage sorghum up to the reproductive stage, you run out of water, it dies, you've got feed. You've got a crop that you can utilize. And so the ability of sorghum to not only uh, survive on limited amount of moisture um, in a short growing period, but also produce something you can market or convert into a marketable product is, uh, is really big. And so I think it's an ideal double crop for the farmers that have livestock. Now, criteria for a double for a, a sorghum variety to be used for winter stockpiling. I highly prefer a variety that does not produce grain. And the, the slide I'm showing here are uh, basically sections taken out of slaughtered beef animals, the inside of the rumen. So what you're looking at is three chunks, uh, and these are approximately life size, three chunks of rumen wall. And the one on the left is what that's supposed to look like. Uh, that is a healthy rumen wall. And you see all those fingers coming out? Those are called papillae. And those fingers increase the absorptive area of the rumen wall for absorbing volatile fatty acids and other products of rumen fermentation uh, that the animal depends on for nourishment. Uh, the one on the right is from a bottle calf that just did not receive enough energy, never, never did develop properly. The one in the middle, the one that looks like it was uh, put on a skillet and cooked, that is a rumen wall from a calf that developed acidosis. When an animal receives too much grain without a period of adaptation, that's what happens to the inside of the rumen. When that happens, the animal loses its, its ability to absorb volatile fatty acids. Also, because that rumen becomes acid, the microbes that digest cellulose, the main component in forages, they die off. They can't, they can't persist in an acidic environment. So essentially, you, when you feed too much grain to a ruminant, uh, that's what happens. It becomes uh, a non-functional ruminant. And if you do this to a brood cow, she's going to really struggle when she goes back, when the grain shuts off. It's okay as long as they continue to receive grain. But when the grain shuts off, then they're in trouble. Uh, it might take six weeks in order for them to heal up from this type of internal injury. Uh, they, they just can't get energy out of forage anymore until all that heals. So I prefer a sorghum package that does not produce grain. And, and there's several, pack, several ways to do that, provide forage without grain. One is to simply plant, like in this one, this is a 120-day um, forage sorghum hybrid that was planted in mid-July after a harvest of spring peas. And because it froze in mid-October, about 90 days later, it never produced grain just ran out of time. Now, another uh, means of pre uh, preventing grain production is uh, this is a photo period sensitive hybrid. And you can see it's about 12 foot tall. Um, photo period sensitive hybrids have, uh, are probably the most drought tolerant and most productive genetic package among the sorghums in terms of total biomass. Um, this hybrid was planted June 20th, and you can see the heads 
uh, have emerged, but they don't have any grain on them. This photo was taken October 4th. The heads just now popped out and it's about 10 days away from frost. This is not going to produce grain. It's just photoperiod sensitives only flower and initiate a head when the day length drops below 12 hours and 20 minutes in the fall. So uh, the plant just keeps growing vegetatively and, and that's the reason they're so productive. They keep growing leaves, they keep growing roots, they keep accessing moisture and they never hit that high water demand stage that, uh, of grain production. Grain production just takes more water than forage production. So that's why they're so water efficient. Another genetic package that does not produce grain is male sterility. The plant, uh, the pollen is infertile and a male sterile. So unless there's another sorghum to act as a pollen donor, it, it won't produce grain. And uh, because it produces an, a head and then the head doesn't ever fill with grain, it's an empty head, um, the plant is still photosynthesizing, but there's no place for that photosynthesis to go. The, the sugar has no berries of grain to fill, so it just builds up in the stem. And what you get with a male sterile is a very sweet, palatable stock. If you want a, uh, the highest quality of stockpiled sorghum, I would use a male sterile. Um, another criteria that I look for is, is uh, the ability to stand. And this is a, a photo I took several years back, probably a dozen years ago, at a, uh, a plot that um, you can tell it was after frost, but a, a tornado had just gone over this plot and every other hybrid in this plot was flat, except for the one I'm looking at here. And so you can see this, this is a dwarf forage sorghum and you can tell it, it's just standing like a rock even under, um, and of course something that's short is gonna have less torque on it than a tall hybrid. And people say, well, I don't want a dwarf, I want something that yields. Uh, take a look at this picture of, uh, that I took of a dwarf hybrid from a plot I put in several years back. Look at the number of leaves on that. Look at, at how dense all those leaves are packed together. Uh, dwarf, brachytic dwarf hybrids, which are, are uh, brachytic means that it has same number of leaves or more, usually it's 50% more leaves, but the inner nodes are shortened. So you get a very high yield of leaves, a low yield of stem. And this, this is a, a very nice package for winter stockpile grazing. And another feature I look for in stockpiled sorghums is brown midrib. And uh, brown midrib makes the plant genetically less able to produce lignin. Lignin is the indigestible component of plant cell walls. The cell contents inside the cell is where all the protein and, and a lot of the sugar, the fat, that's where all the goodies are located is inside the cell. The cell wall contains cellulose and lignin, and cellulose is digestible by a ruminant, lignin is not. So if you take the lignin out of a plant genetically, all of a sudden, everything in that plant becomes digestible. And so uh, the degree of lignin in the plant basically is inversely proportional to its digestibility. Brown midribs just have far more energy value than doesn't really change the protein, but it does change the digestibility of the protein. And you can see uh, this man is holding up uh, brown midrib to the right of the screen and a normal hybrid to the left of the screen. 
you see that, that dark coloration of the midribs where it gets its name. Just to show you a little difference here in, in how animals prefer these, uh, this is a, a grazing trial where the paddock is split between a conventional and a BMR hybrid and they're ISO lines. So these are the same hybrid with and without BMR gene. And you can see they have the tops completely grazed off of the BMR within a short period of time. 10 days later, most of the animals are eating the stems of the BMR in preference to the leaves of the conventional hybrid. And that's pretty significant. And there's a big, you know, there's a 30 to 50% improvement in animal performance by going to a brown midrib hybrid. Now, there is no perfect sorghum variety for stockpiling. You know, this, this photo period sensitive is very productive, it's very drought tolerant, but it gets tall and it tends to lodge. You know, the dwarf, uh, the dwarf varieties that are out on the market um, they're very short, they're, they're, they stand very well, but they're grain producers. And, and the only way you keep them from producing grain is to plant them late, which means late planting reduces your yield potential. If you're in a double crop situation, that's okay. Uh, it might be your best option at that point, but um, we don't have the photo period sensitive dwarf or the male sterile dwarf genetics that also have a BMR. There's just too many recessive genes that all have to align in, in, in multiple back crosses. It takes years and years to create a hybrid like that. And there just aren't any on the market, at least not that I'm aware of. Now, another weakness of sorghum in general is that sorghum does not, is, is, it's very susceptible to iron chlorosis. So it does not grow well on very high uh, soils that are very high in calcium carbonate. One plant that does stockpile very well, um, that's also very productive, not sorghum productive, but, but good, is brown top millet. And that's the plant in the photo here. And uh, we have been using more and more brown top millet in our stockpile mixtures. Um, it's been a popular plant in the Southeast United States for a long time. And the Southeast United States has, you know, wet soils that tend to be acidic. So I always assume that, well, brown top millet fits wet, acidic soils. And we've been using it, um, you know, once we started trying it on dry soils and calcareous soils, we found it works pretty well there too. And, uh, it really keeps its quality very well in a stockpile mix. And it's also really cheap to grow. So I always throw in a few pounds of a brown top millet per acre when I do a stockpile mix. Um, some other plants that we'll put into a stockpile mix to make up for the deficiencies of sorghum. Um, one of the deficiencies is protein, as I mentioned. So having something that's really green and high in protein there in the fall and winter can, can really help out a lot. And this is a picture of our impact forage collards. And collards, uh, uh, this leaf here is probably 25% protein or so. It doesn't take a lot of pounds of this leaf material per acre to really boost the nutritional value of that stockpile mix. Um, usually I'll throw a pound an acre of, of forage collards into my stockpile mixes. Another plant that, um, this is a legume, this is guar, G-U-A-R. Uh, guar, this is the source of commercial guar gum. We found it's also a pretty good stockpile grazer. Um, those pods are full of high protein beans that are encased in kind of a sugary sort of um, sticky substance that uh, very high in sugar, tasty, and high in protein. And animals really go for those pods in the winter time. Plus, where it's a legume, it fixes a little nitrogen. So I like to throw some guar in my winter stockpile mixes. Mung beans, 
um, are a very cheap legume to grow. And um, they tend to hold their beans in the pod pretty well as well. And uh, so that's another addition I'll throw in there. Sunflowers. Um, sunflowers, of course, uh, people don't think of sunflowers as a winter grazing resource because the leaves all drop off. And in the winter time, this beautiful plant here will be nothing but a head and a stick. But at the end of that stick is a very high protein head and, and cattle uh, absolutely love the heads off of oilseed sunflowers in the winter time. And they're full of protein, so that helps boost the protein in the mix. Another thing that sunflowers do is they have a very stiff stalk that helps hold the mix up. It, it prevents that sorghum from lodging. Another stiff stalked plant that can help hold things up is okra. And that's the plant I have here. And uh, okra, like the sunflower, all the leaves are gonna drop off at frost and you're left with a stiff stalk and then those green pods will become full of high protein seed. Now, those pods are not as palatable as the sunflower heads, but once animals dig into them, they, they are very high in protein and uh, they're usually a bit more persistent than the sunflower heads. Another plant or plant type, I should say, that I like to include in a stockpile mix, if you've got the sorghum and you've got the stiff stock plants growing together, it's nice to have a plant that will vine around, like this cowpea is vining around that sorghum, that'll, you know, when you stake up a newly planted tree, you put the stake, the tree, and then you tie them together. And what this cowpea is doing is tying the sorghum plant to a stiff stock plant next to it. And so having a cowpea or other vining plant in there to do that can be very beneficial. And there are some varieties of cowpeas like cat jang. Most cowpea varieties shatter their beans out on the ground pretty readily. Cat jang is a variety that is, is renowned for keeping its peas in the pod longer than other varieties. And we're exploring some other bean varieties that uh, we think will be, uh, will have even more persistence in keeping that on the, uh, keeping those beans on the pod. Um, another um, thing that we found, you know, we have climbing uh, vines and we also have sprawling vines. And uh, this is a, this man is holding up a pumpkin that's not yet ripe. And we've found a lot of utilities with pumpkins and, and other um, cucurbits for including in these stockpile mixes. Uh, you know, the squashes, uh, pumpkins, gourds. Uh, gourds are something we're using now. And they're able to vine around find the places in the canopy where sunlight is getting through and turn it into edible fruit that keeps its quality into the winter. Um, we're out of pumpkins right now, but uh, we are experimenting with some gourds and they're showing some promise. And gourds, unlike pumpkins, will also climb up into the canopy and, and put the gourds, you know, serve that function of tying everything together to the stiff stock plants. Now, when you graze a stockpile mixture, this, this is really critical. And, and I, I can't stress this enough. Strip graze your stockpile mixtures. You, you can see in the diagram here, you start at the water source, have a couple of temporary fences set up, and each day you leapfrog the fence and let animals into the next strip. If you fail to do this, I have seen an instance, won't mention the name of who did it, who had 80 acres of stockpile mix, turned a large herd of animals in there and it happened to rain that night 
and the next day, the entire stockpiled field, I mean, we're talking probably um, 500 tons of standing forage was all stomped into the mud and useless. 500 tons of forage gone overnight. And the main goal of strip grazing is to limit access and stop that trampling. This is a far more efficient way to use this than just letting them have at it. Um, for your sake, please strip graze your stockpiled forages. Be much, much more successful. Um, no, not saying that you're going to lose, you're going to have an event like that, but don't take a chance. It's just too expensive. The strip grazing is really easy. It's fast. It, it does not take much work at all. Um, you just simply start at the water source. I like having the water source at the south end of the field so that the standing crop is always to the north of the animals to act as a windbreak, at least if you're in the northern hemisphere, that is, as a windbreak for the animals. A, a twist on stockpiling is swath grazing. The advantage of swath grazing is that when sorghums freeze, naturally, um, they will move all of their soluble protein and sugars, uh, in most cases, down to the roots. Sor sorghum is botanically, it's a perennial that winter kills. Um, so it behaves like a perennial in that it tries to translocate material down to the roots for the winter. By swathing that material, you can stop that translocation, keep that protein, keep the, the sugars up in the, in the forage, and it opens up an opportunity to do, you can see here the green, the green drill marks. That is rye that was drilled in between the swaths. Now, you could also rake that swath over and drill underneath where the swath laid before if you wanted to add some operations. And um, in this situation, and this was my first attempt at swath grazing on, on my farm, you can see the fence in the upper left-hand corner. Um, the fence is running parallel to the, uh, to the swath. Um, I have had better luck running the fence perpendicular to the swaths before, because what I found is that the animals uh, would grab a hold of the material, shake it, and get it all wrapped up in the fence, knock it down, and then be all over. Um, it is very important with swath grazing to limit access to just one day or preferably a half day material at a time. Anything they don't eat on their first grazing, they will lay on and when they get up, they'll defecate on it and it'll become expensive bedding. So it's much, much more efficient. Make them defecate where they've already eaten, not where you want them to eat. Um, now, a, a follow-up to, uh, a follow-up crop to stockpile grazing. Usually you will have the stockpile used up by February, March, and then what to do with that ground afterwards. Um, depends a lot on what the next crop is. If the next crop is going to be a legume like soybeans, uh, you might want to do um, a, crop, a grass crop like oats to suck up all that nitrogen in the manure and urine spots, and there will be a lot of manure and a lot of urine spots after stockpile grazing. You, the manure density out there is just really amazing. It, it is, if you want to improve a poor quality soil in one year's time, set it aside for stockpile and sorghum grazing. It, it really is amazing. Um, if your next crop is a, a nitrogen demanding crop, you might want to look at spring 
uh, pulse crops, spring legumes like this uh, spring field peas. These are 4010 forage peas uh, that were planted on March 20th, picture taken on May 20th. And you can see there's, there's a lot of nitrogen, also a lot of feed out there. And this can set up another, another sorghum crop and, and that's what happened in this field. Uh, this field was uh, followed um, 10 days later with a, with a sorghum crop. You can do this perpetually. If you have a field that's set up with good winter shelter, you can do this double crop of peas, sorghum, peas, sorghum, peas, sorghum, uh, for a long period of time. And the peas can fix some nitrogen for the sorghum crop. And you can also, either with oats, peas, some combination of spring cereal and spring legume, you can bale those up and use the baled feed as a supplement to the sorghum, the stockpiled sorghum. And one way of doing this is to uh, sen essentially set up bale grazing. And when you, you bale graze, you can use the bale grazing either as a standalone, it's a very economical way to feed animals. The advantage of this is that you don't have to fire up a tractor every single day of the winter to feed. You can fire up a tractor once. And if you only have to fire up a tractor once, you don't even have to own the tractor. You can borrow or lease one for a weekend, stake out all your hay bales you need for winter feeding on a grid, like in the photo here, and simply move an electric fence to allow one day's worth of grazing uh, of, of hay bales at a time. The hay bales can be out on an open field, they can be on a pasture, they can be within your stockpiled sorghum. And you can even put them out there right after you plant the stockpiled sorghum so the bales are already out there. Um, and um, this is a, a picture in Michigan I took of spaced bale feeding. And this guy really had it down to an art. You can see that where the post is located. Of course, in Michigan, one of the problems with uh, moving portable poly wire in the winter time is the ground is frozen solid. Well, this guy found a place that <laughs> that's not frozen solid in the winter to put his next poly wire, and where where he can put his step in post. I thought this was really really ingenious and it really worked well for him. And of course the, uh, the hay, the, the manure that the, the hay produces um, goes right on to the field, right along with the manure from the stockpiled sorghum. So this is a really good way of importing a lot of nutrients into a site. And that's just a close up of the same thing. A little bit of a clearer picture there. And uh, this actually was, I think this is one of my pictures. Um, another way of utilizing sorghum for winter grazing. Um, most sorghum forages, sorghum sedan, are planted to be, I'd say most of them are planted to be baled. Uh, summer grazing is, is a secondary use, but we're probably looking at 70% put up for hay and maybe 20% for summer grazing. About 90% of the sorghum is, is not used for winter stockpiling. Um, but take a look at this. What I have pictured here is this is the regrowth. This is taken in September, uh, late September. The regrowth, the, la the pre last previous grazing was about September 1st and was followed immediately by a planting of rye annual ryegrass and oats. And you see the little seedlings at the bottom of the bottom of the photo coming up. Um, you can see that the sorghum sedan was not terminated, wasn't sprayed, wasn't killed out. The winter stuff was drilled directly in it, no preparation. And the people told me that this would work and I, this is one of those uh, things I had to learn for myself. I said, that cannot possibly work. That summer annual is gonna use up all the moisture 
it's going to use up all the sunlight and that winter annual will not have a chance. And people swore up and down it would work. I said, well, I have a pivot. I have a field with a pivot. I'll do it there because I can make it rain. And right after I planted this, the pivot broke down and I did not get it watered and it worked beautifully. And um, what actually happens is if you're planting in late August, early September, a lot of times um, that air temperature right at that soil surface on bare ground is well over 100 degrees. A cool season plant really struggles in that environment and it uses a huge amount of moisture just trying to keep itself cool. When you plant it into the canopy, I mean, I mean you can look at, at the bottom of that screen um, that soil temperature there is probably over 100. What do you think it is under that canopy of that sorghum sedan? Probably 20 degrees cooler. And so by creating that cooler environment, yes, there's less moisture, there's less sunlight, but it's 20 degrees cooler. And that seedling, those seedlings of the cool season plant use about one quarter of the moisture that they do out in the open. And that levels the playing field. In fact, it usually makes it where the seedlings are more successful under that canopy than they are in the open. And it took me three years in a row of doing this successfully before I convinced myself that I was wrong and that actually does work. And so it's something I really encourage now. And of course, you save the cost of the herbicide burn down. And after frost, this is what you end up with. Those winter annuals um, in the fall tend to be washy. They are often excess protein, low dry matter, uh, low fiber. Well, the frosted sorghum regrowth that you see here is high in fiber. Now it's digestible fiber because it's a brown midrib. So it's digestible fiber, but it's still fiber, makes the rumen work. It's low in protein which it's the, and it's high in dry matter. It's, you know, it's all dried out. So it's a perfect nutritional complement to those high protein, low dry matter, um, and, uh, and, and relatively low energy compared to their protein content, winter annual grasses. So it really works well. And you just wait for a hard freeze for the plants to dry after that hard freeze, so any prussic acid dissipates. And in, in my area, that's usually uh, early November when we get that, that really hard freeze and you know that sorghum is done for. And that's usually when I'm, everything else is kind of played out. Turn them in this very high quality grazing in uh, November and December. And it really, really works well. And so that sorghum regrowth, uh, not just the summer growth, but the regrowth of it can be used for winter grazing as well, especially combined with some winter annuals that are just drilled right in. So um, that's uh, all the material I have prepared for this evening. Um, next week, I'll be talking about some other options for grazing in the winter time um, that don't involve summer annual forages. And just a reminder, if, if you like this stuff, if this is stuff you're interested in, um, I do have my books for sale. Um, if you're interested in those books, um, or if you're interested in ordering seed or, or learning more about what we're talking about, uh, contact us at Green Cover Seed. That's my contact information there. Or any of the other people here at Green Cover Seed, we're, we're happy to help you out. Very good. Thank you, Dale. Uh, I'm going to just dive right in here to some questions. I did get a couple here, like I said, before the webinar. So some of these you kind of touched on, but first, uh, Riley Shea said, why do some people swath graze instead of stockpile graze and which is better in your opinion? And then if you want to share your uh, video now, you can too. Okay. Um, oh. How do I do that? 
Okay, there we go. Are you sure? I, I doubt people <laughs> really get much of a charge out of viewing me. If if you're uh, if you're female and uh, do get a charge out of seeing me, I I'd like to know that. Um, we'll, we'll, I'll, I'll filter all those. How's that sound? <laughs> okay. Yes, please. That that would be nice. Um, I I don't hear those sort of things very often. Um, Almost looks like you're blushing a little there, Dale. Just thinking about that. Uh, I am. Uh, <laughs> But uh, stockpile versus swath grazing. Uh, the stockpile is, is usually a bit more accessible than the snow. The biggest advantage of stockpiling is that you are eliminating a machinery trip. Um, and you're reducing your costs. Um, the, uh, the advantage of the swath grazing is that the swath material is usually better nutritionally because you do it before you get that translocation of nutrients down into the roots. Uh, it gives you the opportunity to plant another crop into that swath material in between the swaths. So you can uh, start another crop growing. Uh, where you swath and where you, where you stockpile um, that's an individual decision, obviously, but in general, um, the if you have fall moisture, um, you can have the ability to get something green and going and, and add to your total yield. Um, you'll get more total yield out of the swath grazing than you will the stockpile grazing, uh, but you do have that extra cost of the swathing itself. To contend with, and so um, that—that's kind of my thoughts on swath grazing versus stockpile. Hey, hey, Dale, would you say it's also accurate that in areas where they get a lot of snow, it's easier for the cattle to pull that forage up out of a swath than it is with standing grazing that all just goes flat across the whole field? Yeah, depending on the standability of the forage. Yes, absolutely. Um, if if it all goes flat. Yeah, it's, it's much more accessible to them out of the swath. And there are people that claim that once cattle are trained to the swath grazing, that they, uh, they'll they dig down through three feet of snow, find that swath. Um, and that's another reason the fence perpendicular to the swaths, because they, they can find that swath easier if they're starting you know, if, if they don't have to walk back and forth to find it, if they know where it is from the previous day's grazing. And so, and they'll kind of just make a tunnel and follow it from one end to the other. And uh, they look like big black ducks bobbing under the surface of the snow. Got questions here that are somewhat related. One person was asking if uh, you'll be talking about grazing corn. I don't know if you'll be talking about that next week. And then also um, someone said just an observation, wondering why sun hemp was not. Okay. Um, I almost put sun hemp in here. In fact, I, I forgot actually. The value of sun hemp is that it is very stiff stocked. Um, provides some wind protection and it, uh, because of the really stiff stalks, and also it can kind of tie everything together, uh, or it can provide that same support that sunflowers or uh, okra might. Um, and of course it's a legume, so it fixes some nitrogen, that's good. Um, uh, the drawback to sun hemp, of course, is that they're, in the winter time, there's just absolutely nothing edible on it. Um, so, uh, it's, I'll, I'll throw a little bit in a stockpile mix. It's not something I spend a lot of money on, but um, I know people that do stockpile mixes and they'll always routinely and they'll, they'll throw sun hemp in there for, for those purposes. Okay. Uh, and I'm assuming, are you going to talk about grazing corn next week? Grazing corn? Yes, I will actually um, uh, talk about it in, in a couple of different aspects. Um, grazing corn as a, a stockpile, um, corn does not have the waxy cuticle 
that protects it from weathering like the uh, sorghum does. It's not quite as drought tolerant. Um, but there are some niches in which uh, corn is superior to sorghum. We'll talk about those next week. Okay. Um, question here from Jake. Conger said that uh, he's in north central Kansas. He's got two stockpile mixes that he'll plant uh, around June 20th. In mm -hmm. both those mixes, he's got turnips. Uh, he said, okay. just curious about if they, if they will bolt uh, planted in that heat. So maybe just kind of cover brassicas in general. Are there? Okay, yeah. The time um, brassicas and stockpile mixes. Um, some brassicas have planted early before the summer solstice will uh, can bolt. Uh, if you spring plant, you know, your typical daikon radish um, instead of great big edible roots uh, that go deep into the ground, you'll get a whole mass of, of pretty white flowers that butterflies love and roots the size of a pencil. Um, the, the, the daikon radishes, uh, the, the nitro radish, when you plant um, in, in April or May, looks completely different than when you plant it in August. Now, usually the brassicas, um, if I'm planting after about July 15th, um, they become a bigger and bigger player in the mix. Um, the turnips planted in June 20th, um, my, my bigger concern at that time, not, not bolting, turnips aren't known for doing much bolting like the radishes are, um, is just the amount of heat they have to go through. Um, just making it through the summer alive uh, without uh, desiccating. Um, and that's why my, my go-to brassica uh, during the summer is collards. Now, graza radish is a, a very, very heat tolerant brassica, maybe even a little better than the collards, but it's also very expensive. And uh, so a lot of people don't don't use the graza radish because of the expense. Dale, I, I mentioned on the on the chat thread that the Georgia's, uh, the, the impact forage collard is one of the parents of that is a Georgia Southern collard. Yes. And that's where it gets its high protein, but it also gives it really good heat tolerance, but yes. it's crossed out with a kale of some sort, and that gives it very good cold tolerance as well. So yeah. uh, it, you're, you're right, it, it's got the best heat tolerance of any of the brassicas in my opinion. Yeah, and it's it's right up there uh, among the handful of most cold tolerant as well. So it 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 both handles the summer heat and grows a long ways into the winter. And so yeah, it's beneficial on both ends, and and that's one of the reasons why you, we use so much of it in winter stockpile mix. Okay. Craig Altman says, "What animal health issues need to be managed when?" when grazing frost killed sorghum? Okay, um, the biggest concern of course, well, I, I'd say there's two concerns uh, with, with grazing sorghum. Um, one is prussic acid. Um, stockpiled mixes because they're grazed in the winter, prussic acid is an issue of, uh, I guess, growing sorghum and then, but you hardly ever see a prussic acid poisoning from grazing sorghum sedan or even forage sorghum during the growing season. It is by far most hazardous um, at the time of frost. The prussic acid is a compound that is released when two different plant compounds become mixed. One of those compounds is in the, the uh, epidermis cells of the plant, which is the very outside layer of cells on the leaf. The other compound is in the middle of the leaf. Normally they don't come in contact. The only way they really come in contact a little bit during the chewing process, but not much. The other time they come into contact is when the, you have a freeze and the cells all burst and liquefy 
and you can see like after a freeze and the leaves are wilted, they're black, that's when those two compounds come together. And at that point, it, it can be very dangerous. So when you're grazing the stockpiled sorghum, wait until it is thoroughly frozen and dried. You want it to freeze and then dry. When the, the plants are all tan colored, no green, that's when they're safe. So usually around here, that's usually November. Um, the other problem is uh, typically nitrate. And the nice thing about stockpiled sorghum is that, you know, all plants accumulate nitrate when there's an abundance in the soil. It's not unique to sorghum. But nitrate is natural, necessary for the plant. It's what the plant uses to convert into protein. So um, if you allow sufficient time, the nitrate just basically gets turned into protein. By, with a stockpile mix, when you're given the entire growing season for that plant to metabolize that nitrate into protein, it's really not much of a risk. Really, stockpiled sorghum is a, a pretty low risk way of utilizing sorghum. It, it's really lower risk than baling that sorghum, which is usually and often done when the plant is still high in nitrate. The other thing is, is in a stockpile setting, the lower stem is the very last thing that's consumed and that's the part of the plant that is highest in nitrate. So I, you know, I suppose it's possible to get nitrate poisoning on stockpiled sorghum especially if a severe drought just completely stunted the growth. I've never really seen it, but it's common in, in baled hay. Okay. I've got a question here from Jeff Barnett. Said, so what time of year is best to drill in a winter mix? Um, and specifically in, he's in Texas, but uh, what would be more related to this? What would be kind of your cutoff time for planting stockpile mixes versus going in, going ahead and just planting a, a winter? Yeah. Uh, I mean, that's going to vary by location, but usually uh, the prime time for planting winter mixes is probably about 60 days prior to your first frost. I think your, your cool season plants. Um, so somewhere... I'd say your cutoff for summer annuals versus winter annuals, somewhere in that 75 to 90 days prior to your first frost. Um, and then you, I, I'd say 75, probably when you want to make the switch. Now, if you're in that 60 to 90 range, that's a good time to plant a blend of summer annuals and winter annuals. That's when it really works. That's when your brassicas and sorghum blend or your brassicas and corn blend uh, work really well. And someone asked about grazing corn and I can guess I, we can jump ahead to that a little bit, but um, you know, where corn really shines for winter grazing is when it's getting too late to plant sorghum because corn has more cold tolerance than sorghum. Corn will grow at 50, sorghum needs 60. And in the fall, there's a lot of days that are between those temperature ranges. And I'll show some photos next week of where we fall plant corn. You don't think about planting corn in the fall. Well, for winter grazing, it actually works really well. And um, if you're in that 60, somewhere between 90 and 60 days before your first frost, that's where corn can really dominate and, and uh, really make a, a, an extreme contribution to winter grazing. So, okay. It, it doesn't persist as well into the winter as what sorghum does though. Sure. Last question here from Lonnie. Uh, Ohio used to push planting oats in July for stockpile. Is that something you'll be talking about next week or? Yes. Absolutely, and, and choice. But I think there's actually better choices, similar to oats, uh, among the among the uh, spring cereals. There's some uh, oats are good, but there's some some other spring cereals that I think are better. And uh, so that's why we don't. That's why we carry more than just 
oats. Still a good choice, but we've got some better, I think. Yep. That diversity aspect is really important. Absolutely. Yep. Well, uh, we're going to wrap up here. I haven't mentioned this for a few weeks, but we do have our soil health resource guide. You can get that for free on our website um, where you can go request a copy. We actually have an article in there. Uh, did you write that, Dale, or was that someone else on the stockpile? Grazing? I don't remember. Okay. Well, there's an article in there uh, about stockpile grazing. So just wanted to throw that out there. That's free. We cover the shipping and everything. So if you guys want that, um, you can go to our website. In the meantime, uh, we will, I guess, leave you hanging for part two next week. Like I said, I'll register all of you guys so that you'll get an email for that. Dale, thank you so much for your time. Keith, thanks for answering questions in the chat. And we'll see you guys next week to conclude our stockpile grazing mix webinar. Thanks for joining, Bye. everybody. Thanks for, thanks for everybody for listening. All right. We'll see you guys next week.